77 and 78. Council, hang on for one second, let them just clear. <coughs> Council, would you like some rebuttal time? Please, uh, three minutes, Your Honor. Three minutes, sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Kathy Reardon. Uh, I appear on behalf of the uh, appellant, Tara Gravino. Uh, we submit to the court that Ms. Gravino's rights were violated on two fronts here. First, that she was denied the right to conflict-free counsel, and secondly, that her plea was not knowingly and voluntarily entered because she was never notified until she was being escorted out the door to serve her sentence that she would be certified as a sex offender. There, there are people in prison now who probably don't know that they, when they come out, they're going to f they find themselves in front of the SORA board. Would it be your position, then, that all of those sentences are, in, are unstable? It is, Your Honor. Uh, I, I would submit to the court, and, and it's apparent here that when she moved to vacate her plea, um, she moved to vacate it, indicating that there was a conflict, an outright conflict with her counsel. Um, at that time, she wasn't aware that she would be certified. She couldn't make the motion based upon that because she wasn't aware um, that that would even happen until the clerk mentioned to the judge, what? hey, you, you have to um, issue the surcharges here for sex offender registration. And then the DA, what? as she's walking out, says, oh, and by the way, judge, you have to indicate that she's a sex offender. And he said, so what? And that's so the what's, end of it. what's the relationship of this to the, to the PRS cases? I think there's a direct relationship. And Explain. Go ahead. I, and I think it's because they are both obviously very significant. Um, I think that you are, when you're sentenced, you're sentenced uh, to the post-release supervision as part of the sentencing. In terms of the sex offender registration, the, the certification, that also happens directly at the time it's that you... A direct I'm sorry? So we consider it a direct consequence of the plea. I submit that it is a, the, at, at the very is, least... Is it punishment? I'm sorry. Is it punishment? I believe that it is punishment. And I and know that we said a few times that it isn't. I know that this court has held that it is a collateral consequence and that it is not punishment and that's remedial. But I would suggest to this court that as every time that they uh, amend that statute, it gets ratcheted up and ratcheted up. And under both post release supervision and SORA, um, there are very strict supervisory um, conditions that are placed on, on these individuals. In both situations, if there is a violation of both the post-release supervision and of SORA, that these people are subjected to not only uh, jail time under their individual statutes, but also as a result of uh, parole or probation there violations. There is a substantial difference, though, in who decides between the PRS and the SORA, because you've got a mandatory statute where the judge pronounces post-release supervision, but you have a SORA board that reviews the facts and determines and may upward or downward adjust the level. Isn't, I mean, there's a whole administrative process that intervenes here before it even reaches the court for that, SORA that, determination. Doesn't that make this different? Well, here's, here's the, 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 uh, the comparison between the two. Again, yes, you're correct that the, that the board is the one who makes the recommendations, um, and then they have the hearing, and based upon those recommendations, um, but ultimately it's the court that makes the decision regarding the risk level determination. One of the, one of the other possibilities that, that happens in these cases is the possibility of civil confinement afterwards. Would correct. you consider that to be a, a component of the sentence to advise a defendant that, that he or she may be subject to civil confinement? You know, the difference, I think, there is that, that that's something that possibly could happen um, down the line while they're serving their sentence, sentence and thereafter. In, in this situation, they are going to be um, determined a certain risk level, whether it's a one, two, or three. There's no question about it. Once so this is, this is so your, the, the, the commonality is that they're both part of the sentence? Well, and I know is that, that the... the 
And I'm sorry. And, and I know that the courts have held that although the certification is part of the judgment of conviction, that the ramifications, the conditions right, and everything else, thereafter are, are not part of the sentence. I, again, I would submit that although I know that this You're saying, found, it, 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 when you keep saying, well, we know what we found, so you're saying in reality it's in part re of the sentence. In reality, it's absolutely Putting part aside of our precedent. A absolutely. And, and Your Honors, I, as so I... What do we do with our precedent? Do we have to set aside all these times we've said it's civil in nature, it's not punishment, it's to protect the public? Well, Do we what, have to overrule a lot of cases to find in your favor? Well, what I'd love to tell the court is I'm concerned about my client, but... Um, well, we have to be concerned a little bit more broadly. A absolutely you do. And, and I think in the situation of post-release supervision, those cases came back because those people were going into jail serving their time, but they weren't informed about this post-release supervision, and those cases came back to this and court. What is, it, what is it that you're proposing that the sentencing judge has to say at the time of sentencing? First of all, Your Honor, I, I think that there's got to be some indication, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of, of the plea. These people have to know that as a part That's of... That's what I'm asking you. Specifically, what does the sentencing judge say? I, I think they he have can, to... He or she can't answer the question, what am I going to have to do? They I, won't know if it's just registration right. or it's you can't move. You're not going to know what level they are because hmm. conduct in prison can also contribute right. to the level that you're eventually designated. Uh, absolutely. I think at the very least, that judge has to notify them you, as a result of this particular plea, will be designated a sex offender who will be subject to all of the ramifications of SORA. Now, they have an attorney who has a responsibility to go ahead and explain what the ramifications are. In this case, um, it's highly suggested that that never happened. And this is a little unique because, as, as you notice in the pre-plea, um, my client was notified that she would not be SORA registrable. And the plea that she was taking, she took a plea to the rape third, they indicated that SORA would only be um, applied to the rape second. So not only does it appear anywhere on the record that she was notified that she would be subject to SORA, um, but, that, um, <laughs> excuse me, but that she would not be um, SORA registrable. She was misinformed, is that what you're saying? As a result of the pre-plea, she was, yeah. And there was nobody who, who ever corrected that error. The court didn't do it, and, and her counsel didn't do it. How and does, I, how did, I'm sorry, go ahead. How does this case square with Katu? Well, I think, again, yeah, I'll go back to the post-release supervision situation. Um, I think that the situation is such that it's such an important part of that sentence um, that they need to be notified before they take that plea that this is something Katu that... Katu wasn't be, based on whether it was punishment or not, right? Uh, no, but although, although again, with, with post-release supervision, they made it part of the sentence. Right. But, but I would suggest... the voluntariness of the plea? Isn't that what we're talking about? We are what, talking about voluntariness. Yeah, but, but I would, would suggest that the legislative history, the memorandum in support of post-release supervision is incredibly identical to what they were talking about in SORA. And the whole purpose between both of them was that when this person is released to the communities, that there's protection for those communities um, from these people going out and causing crimes. So it's an crimes informed again. plea issue? I think it, I that think you in can't one have respect, an informed plea? I, I think it is an informed so plea. So if the judge, if the sentencing judge makes an error and based on the nature of the crime says to the defendant at the time of sentencing, this, you've been found convicted of a crime that's subject to SORA, you're going to have to register. And that's all that sentencing judge says. And then based on subsequent behavior during the term of incarceration, the SORA board comes back and designates level two or level three. Does that defendant now get to say, my plea wasn't, I wasn't properly informed at the time of my plea and ask for vacature? Right. And, and I mean, there's a lot of different variables here. There certainly that are. Didn't exist in the post-release supervision context. There, there certainly are, and, and of course, the litany of cases saying, you know, a judge at the time of taking the plea doesn't have to explain everything, which is where the direct and the collateral comes in. Um, the deportation cases, for, for now, instance. Have we ever found anything to be a direct consequence other than the post-release supervision? I'm sorry. Have we ever found anything other than? 
post-release supervision to be a direct rather than a collateral consequence of a plea? No. So uh, this would be, if we find in your favor, this would be the second time. This would be the second one, yeah. And, and, and again, I, I know that, that, you know, in terms of the deportation cases, um, that's a different situation, though, because you're dealing with um, agencies, like, like the, uh, the judge mentioned before. You're dealing with agencies who are, who are making those determinations. Here, granted, there are agencies involved because the board comes up and puts this whole thing together. But ultimately, it's the court who this comes back to um, after this person is about to be released from prison who makes that risk level determination. Could you touch on the council issue a little bit? Yeah, again, in this situation, um, she made the motion to vacate because the attorney turned out to be the individual who represented her ex-husband on a custody battle against her. In the pre-plea, it's apparent that, the, that this was contentious. There were two ex-husbands and there were two custody matters going on. Now, I know that, that the court had indicated, hey, we talked about this before. There's nowhere in the record that there was, that there was any conversation, what it contained, who was present. And, and even if there was a meeting. She, she didn't know who was representing. She, she, was, she was aware. It, it, initially, she was represented by the public defender's office who had a conflict because they represented the complainant. Then she was assigned this individual who represented her for about a month. Shortly after the Huntley hearing, she indicated that she had gone to see another attorney. But she was, um, she was indigent, so she had assigned counsel. But does this record really show that there was a conflict that infected the representation? I, I think the conflict is apparent on the record. In terms of... Is, is, it, is it necessarily a conflict that you were adverse to that client in a previous unrelated matter? The, re the reason why it would be a conflict, Your Honor, is because um, the custody matter, at least one of the custody right. matters, was currently pending. In fact, they, they adjourned it to several days after this situation. But was, the, was the lawyer still in it? That's the question. That, that's the question so, that was... So your remedy is we should hold a hearing on the conflict issue? Yes, Your Honor. I think that needs to or go direct back. Hearing the yeah, I think a determination needs to be made in terms of that. And I think it did, in fact, operate because she moved to vacate. She indicated that she had witnesses for this individual who he never called. He's got a responsibility to a prior client. And that prior client turned out to be her ex-husband in a custody battle against her. Okay. Okay. Thank thanks, Counselor. Counselor? Good morning. Christopher Bachman, Assistant District Attorney for Wayne C County. Counsel, let me, let me ask you a question. Yes. Isn't SORA in, in real terms, couldn't it be argued that that's a, a worse consequence than PRS? In terms of, you know, we're talking about this particular situation that we have with this defendant. I can understand that people would make that argument based on their perception that the sex offender tag and having to go back at some point and notify people where you're living is something that they don't want to have to do. Well, they know, but in terms of common sense, it, wouldn't it seem that, that, at least at first blush, that it is a, a more severe consequence? I mean, is that, can more that really be argued than, the other way? Than post-release? Yeah. No. No. Well, Talk in, the case, in the case that's following you, uh, the arguments made, I can't go back to my family because I can't, you know, I can't associate with, with young children. I've got young children. And if I'd known that, I never would have taken a plea. So at least in some instances, it can be more severe than simply reporting to your parole office. I don't really know too much about the next case, but I believe that's a person who's being placed on probation and not allowed to see his own children. Um, a completely separate factual issue. Post-release, you are under supervision of a parole officer. You can be uh, hauled in, tested, put back into a local jail, even sent back to the prison for the time that's left on your post-release. SORA requires that you notify law enforcement where you are. Uh, you may have to show up and have your figure, your uh, photo taken. So your argument, years. your argument is that PRS is more severe, more even severe. with the stigma of right. SORA and, and you Absolutely, know, the, because it affects punishment and affects liberty, and you are under the control of a person when you come out of prison. Doesn't SORA require, too, that you can't live certain places? Depending on what level that you are, yes. I, I, I just remember somebody making the comment that with all of these restrictions on 1,000 feet from here and 500 feet from there, that the only place you could live was in the middle of a creek. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> go, 
good answer. Does that, yeah. does that seem restrictive? Uh, it, it, it seems restrictive, but you've got to remember what, what the purpose of the Sexual, Sexual Registration Act is for. It is to notify the community and protect the community. So it is not punitive. That, that's sort of a public notice, isn't it? There's also an aspect of this which exposes you to the Internet, isn't that so? It exposes you to what, sir? It exposes you to the Internet. Uh, depending if you are a level three, you might be on the Internet. That's true. You're also going to be able to go if you are a level public two. scarlet letter. Yes. Could affect your ability to get a job. Yes. So it, it, it gets back to Judge Libin's original question. It, it, in some ways, it can be more restrictive, more difficult than simply post-release. Uh, I think being on post-release affects your ability to get a job. It will also affect where you can live, where you're employed. You think as much as being a, a, um, a level two offender in the SORA case? Um, well, a sore case may affect where you live, um, your choice of where you live. It seemed to me it would be quite difficult in terms of getting a job, in terms of going about your life. You can see that it's difficult and it may be unwanted, um, but it is not punitive, and that's not the purpose. But you could see the argument that in real terms, you know, it could be argued strongly <coughs> that SORA is more, has more of a direct consequence in your life than PRS. Could be argued. I'm not saying it, it could be you argued, have to agree. I not agree with that argument. Okay. Why shouldn't we revisit our past categorization that it's not punishment? Uh, I think the court was correct in all of the cases where they've ruled that it was remedial, there to protect the community, there to notify the community, and that it was collateral. Um, like your loss of driving privileges, potentially loss of voting, your ability to travel, those things have all been determined to be collateral. You addressed in K2 that um, if it's collateral, the court does not have to notify you as a consequence of your plea. So on the SORA issue, she failed for two reasons. One, you don't have to notify the court is under no obligation at the time of your plea to tell you of every possible but consequence. But K2 is about that PRS is part of the sentence, right? Yes, but you said in that. It's not, it's not about, it's not on whether it's punishment or not. Correct. But you adopted the. the so, the, the but you're talking all about. Punishment, remedial, rather than punishment. That's not what Katu was about. It was about collateral and direct, as you were adopting Ford, right. saying that. But again, the PRS is part of the sentence. PRS is. SORA is not. So the court was under no obligation to advise her, in fact, could advise her of all the possible ramifications regarding SORA at the time of the plea. So it was knowingly, voluntarily entered. Additionally, it was unpreserved. You've held its collateral. She didn't preserve it at the trial court. We're done. Almost all other states have some form of a SORA statute. How do they handle it? Almost all of them, I think with the exception of, of one or two, have determined that it is a collateral issue, does not have to be told at the time of the plea. Do you know what happens as a practical matter? It, do, a lot of, do a lot of judges, uh, I, I don't know in your county, but do, do, is it routine? that it's not mentioned, or does it get mentioned occasionally, or, because I know I've seen, I know I've read transcripts where, uh, where judges have mentioned it. Please. Yeah. And I've seen it mentioned in our county, I've seen it not mentioned in our county. Okay. What do you think in the majority it would be? I mean, just, I'm asking, not a rhetorical question. I have no way to, to, to know. No way to know. What about this pre-plea uh, document? That there is nothing on the record that indicates that the, uh, any attorney ever, either one of the two attorneys she had, ever told her or that she ever saw it. So this, the idea that she but was... Doesn't that make the conflict issue worse? Because in many cases, a very experienced attorney will make a, an agreement where a, a defendant is permitted to uh, enter a plea to a crime which does not involve a sort of registration simply to avoid that. Now, when we come back around full circle to this particular defendant uh, raising this conflict issue, it makes it even uh, more o o onerous, does it not? Well, I don't think you look at conflict to determine what the, res the result is to say whether or not there was a conflict. So the fact that this attorney who represented her at the time of the plea didn't get her a non-sex offense isn't the judgment by which you judge his conduct. Baldi and Benavito say you look at the totality of the circumstances and everything regarding prejudice. And here, there is not either enough record to determine conflict, which is what the Court of Appeals said, or if you look at the record and conclude that there is, there is not enough evidence to say that there was a conflict, or even if there was a significant possibility. Do you think we should send it back for a hearing on the conflict? I say no, because she hasn't demonstrated 
that is operated on the conflict. And she could, has could she make a 440 motion and try to demonstrate that? She could. She could still do it today or tomorrow? Correct. And that's what the Court of Appeals actually said. They chose not to address that issue, saying you've got a 440 because it's outside the record. You mean you mean, mean, you mean the appellate division? division, yes. Appellate division. So I would if, submit. If we were, uh, going back for a minute to the, uh, the collateral direct issue, if we were writing on a clean slate here, but it makes sense for us to adopt a rule like I guess they've got in California that says uh, you should tell them, but sometimes it's harmless error not to tell them. I realize that causes some little problem with our cases, but wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't that be fairer? Uh, I guess it depends on what your definition of fair is. I don't think well, that the court. Well, isn't there, isn't there, I don't know whether it's true in this case or not, but can't there be some cases of real hardship where someone has no idea that he or she is getting into this lifetime situation? Uh, or a possible lifetime situation when she takes the plea. Is that possible? Yes. Do we know that it happens? No. And wouldn't it be in the same vein? And I don't mean it that it is silly, but why are we engaging this fiction, which to some degree it is, depending on how you want to look at it, that SOAR is collateral? Wouldn't a California-type solution, as Judge Smith indicates, at least bring some element of... of of sense to this, you know, with the, uh, because I think one could view it as being very much divorced from reality that it's collateral. Well, I guess you could overlook and overturn all your precedents. Yeah, yeah, but putting that aside, California isn't that bad, really, to, to say that you should tell them, but it could be harmless. Does that make sense to you as an approach? Which I guess is what Judge Smith was asking. No. No. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> you know, the honesty here is getting out of here. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel? Thank you. Just briefly. Uh, in regards to the question asked whether this could be brought on a 440, the problem being that I, I think I mentioned before is that I believe this is apparent on the record. And if that's the case, then she may not be in a position to bring a 440. We, we can tell from the record whether... He was representing her ex-husband in a custody proceeding it's, at the same time this case was pending? It is on the record that this individual was represented. It, there is no time limit as to when that It could have been a year ago. It could have been, you know, one day ago. But, but you're correct in that manner. But if the court were to find that this was apparent on the record, she can't bring the 440. But we could find it's not. And then she could bring the 440. It's not, right? In which case, uh, which case you'd have your 440-10. That's correct. That would be another way to do it. And, and, and just, again, and, and I think the, the, the judge used the term scarlet letter, which I think is exactly what happens here. Um, what has happened to her as a result of this is devastating because she lost her children when she went into to incarceration as a result of this, and that continues to this day because of what's going on. With so her. your answer to the question we asked your adversary is that it's a far worse consequence. Far worse because in, than PRS. in this, uh, so, or, uh, excuse me, PRS goes up to five years. Um, SORA can go on from 20 years yeah, to but lifetime. But PRS can put you back in jail without any new conviction. SORA can put you back in jail if there are violations, Your Honor. If there are there, violations there under 168. There would be a trial on the violation. There would be a trial, but it's under 168. You are still subject to um, a violation and a violation of probation as a result. So you, you could suffer the same consequence. Well, isn't that a consequence really of the probation rather than SORA? I mean, I guess you can be, you can certainly be registered under SORA without being on probation or parole, right? However, if you um, violate the registration or the verification provisions, um, those result initially in a misdemeanor and then in a felony. Would, would the, but those have to be prosecuted and proved. They would, yes, they would have to be prosecuted. Before you go, could, could you describe the scenario when she complained about her lawyer? Was she pro se? She, nope. she took the plea. She took the plea. Then she moved to withdraw saying, my lawyer has a, has a conflict, right? That happened at sentencing. She, she took the plea, and about three weeks later, I think, she was at sentencing, and the minute they walked into sentencing, her attorney wanted to talk to her, and she said, no, I want to withdraw my plea because I have not been properly represented. I had witnesses that he won't talk to, and he represented my ex-husband in a custody battle against me, and the court said, we've already talked about this. Was she, the lawyer standing there? The lawyer was standing there, and I would note that he remained silent throughout 
Not one time did he say anything to, in terms of, I did, I didn't, nothing. Well, and even, did, did she know all of this before she entered the plea? Or it, the record doesn't tell us? The record doesn't tell us. Okay, counsel. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you both. Cassie, you want rebuttal time? Thank you, Your Honor. Two minutes, please. Two minutes. Go ahead. Your Honor, Tom Rankin for the appellant. Okay. Counsel, let's cut to the chase a little bit here. Yes, Your Honor. Your case was mentioned, you know, in the context of the last case. What about this situation where, I think Judge Piggott mentioned it, where your, your person, your defendant says, I would never have agreed to this if I knew I couldn't uh, uh, see my family um, or go back to my family. How does that compare to the two things we're talking about, you know, in the other case, the consequence? Well, it's important to note this was a six-month term of a jail, not even imprisonment. Right. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for a person to say, well, at six months I'm going to go home and live with my family. It's very onerous to say after the plea, well, no, you can't go live with your Was kids. Was it enough that they said they should be, he'd be subject to probation? I don't think so, because as the Santosky case points out, this is a fundamental right to live with your children. I mean, the, the probation report reflects that they actually told him, you know, we're going to recommend that you don't get near your children. Post plea, yes. Yeah. Post plea, he finds out this information. But, so he didn't know the conditions of probation before the plea at all? No, no, no. Not to my knowledge, Your Honor. I did, think did he, he didn't move at that point to take the plea back, or did he? Am I mis uh... He goes through the PSI process, shows up for sentencing, and his defense counsel makes an oral motion to vacate the plea. The, so, sorry, the SORA part here is not an issue, right? I, I'll point out that my client was not informed of the SORA prior, but... Uh, but it's not an issue here. I, it's not raised on appeal, no. Okay. Go ahead, continue, Governor. Uh, I think... The, if the court finds the plea colloquy was inadequate, I don't think it's fair to put the burden on the defendant to resolve the plea colloquy by making a motion to vacate the plea. But normally in probation, if he didn't know the exact terms, it would probably be okay, right? You're, you're saying here, again, the consequence, the consequence, the direct consequence was so great that this presents a different picture. Is that right? Normally in probation, Yes. Be a subject to probation, probation, that's enough, right? Uh, normal terms of probation are such that you can't enter an establishment where the primary purpose is the sale of alcohol. That's not an onerous term. That's not the same as you can't go home and live with your children. Is it practical to put the kind of burden that you're suggesting, putting on the, on the judge taking the plea, that he has to anticipate what, the, what, what probation conditions are going to be, and if they're really onerous ones, he has to warn him? I think when a person is pleading to a sex crime, the judge is going to say, not only is the sentence legal, but is it appropriate for this person to have contact with children, especially with a six-month term of jail. And I think that the judge should take that into but consideration. How, but, how, but how many other things are there that you probably should anticipate if you think about it uh, that uh, uh, is going to have a very serious effect on someone's future life? I mean, can you... Isn't that why direct consequence is so narrowly defined? Because you can't really expect that. Admit. We, we deportation, pretty serious consequence. But we've said it's collateral because it's not automatic. It doesn't there in every case, and you can't. You just can't. You have to have a routine the judge can go through, and you, you can't. This sort of thing doesn't work well in a routine. I think it does, John, because with the immigration cases, the trial court, the state court, has no control over federal law in that case. In this situation, the court has absolute control to say, you can have contact with children, you cannot have contact with children. I think this is not an onerous burden on and trial courts. And the matter that the probation report seemed to indicate that this is a, an essential part of the, the, uh, the sentence, not discretionary, is that what you're relying on to? The, the yes, Your Honor. This is uh, to Whatever the court feels about burdens on trial courts, we're talking about living with your family. In my reply brief, I point out that's living with them, school things, medical appointments, all those things that parents do, 
Mr. Ellsworth cannot do right now. If the, if the sentencing judge doesn't know that this is going to be a recommendation until they get, until she gets the pre-sentencing report before the sentencing, the plea's already been entered, then what happens? I think... I mean, it's, it's not unusual that sometimes a defendant may not have been convicted of abusing other children, but some other family member during the course of the probation interviews may say, yeah, he also abused me. So the, the pre-sentencing report may suggest no contact with the family. Does that invalidate the plea? Does the judge then have to say, I have to vacate the plea? I think the pre-sentence investigation and the recommendations are just that, recommendations. I think prior to the plea, when a no, person's... the plea's already been taken. We're yes. talking about the interviews that occur before the sentencing. If... So you've got a pre-sentencing report coming in two weeks before the date for the, for the judge to determine the sentence. And the report for the first time raises the issue of having contact with kids? And the person is pledged with sex crime or just a crime yes. in general? Yes. I think when a person comes to a court pleading to a sex crime, separate and distinct from whatever probation says, the judge prior to the plea is saying this is a sex crime, I need to consider whether or not the person can have uh, contact with children. To say it at the time of the PSI report when that comes to the court that suddenly the judge says, well, I didn't consider a contact with but children. Isn't this really larger than sex crimes? I mean, can't you see a possibility where a pre-sentence report comes back with an onerous condition relating to any kind of crime, which had not been anticipated uh, by the defendant at all? In that situation, I think the court should allow the person to withdraw the plea. This comes up uh, regularly with community service in Chautauqua County. I say community service wasn't part of the plea. The court usually says you can vacate the plea or you can proceed under these terms. And that comes up regularly. I don't think that's anything new, though. In that, in that sense, why is this case, I mean, isn't this just unique? I mean, if he, if he said, look, what I, what I understood, no contact with uh, young children meant was, you know, obviously not my family, every, you know, any other people, but, and I didn't understand that, and I want to move to vacate, and the judge could either believe him or not or choose to let him vacate or not. That's what we have here, but we have an inadequate plea colloquy, and I don't think that motion resolves the inadequate plea colloquy. I see. If okay, no counsel. Questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you'll have your rebuttal. Counsel? Good morning. May it please the Court. Tracy Brunez, uh, Assistant DA in Chautauqua County. What about this issue about how directly, how, what a severe personal impact this is? And it may that, have a severe personal impact. Is that there. not important in terms of a plea? Well, I think the precedent this court has set is absolutely correct. We either have a direct consequence or we have a collateral consequence. You think this, it's collateral consequence, never to be able to see your family or live with your family? This is not necessarily that type of potential problem. This, Why? Because we're talking 10 years probation. We're talking this it was a condition of probation. Wherein, That's an awful long time to have that yes, kind of consequence, is, don't you think? Absolutely, Your Honor. There's no question about it. All right? But he could have petitioned the court, the sentencing court. Hey, can you vacate this condition? That's not on the record. He never did that. He never asked the court, could I have supervised visits with my children? Can I attend school events? with another adult present and always be in the presence of another adult. But, but the issue is whether his plea was knowing and voluntary. Can you really say a plea was knowing and voluntary when something as important as this was, was not known when he took it? Yes, Your Honor. Because what we're talking about and what counsel for appellant wants us to focus on is a fundamental right. That's not the test. In Ford, the court gave various examples of collateral consequences that affected fundamental rights, the right to vote, the right to bear arms. So unfortunately, there yeah, are but, times but how could he how could he be informed about what he did if this wasn't known to him? I mean, in this, in this case, being on probation 
I don't think to the normal person would assume that it had this, this consequence. Is it in the part well, of, how could he agree? How could he agree to this? Frankly, Your Honor, I think anybody who molests a child and, uh, and uh, admits to it has to have a, some thought in the back of their mind that maybe I'm going to prohibit So you think when children. they said probation that he should have interpreted and said, oh, I'm not going to be able to go back and live with my family? I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm time. just saying so in what reality. Are you saying? I'm saying in reality there had to have been that seed in the back of anybody's head. But, but really, that, that could be a condition. Isn't the real question whether or not he would have entered the plea had he known of this potential consequence? It, it could have been. And if, and if he can make a persuasive presentation that he would not have fled under these conditions, then of course we have a different outcome. Do we then not? his remedy is to move to withdraw the plea. You, you want a motion because as these cases come up, there are people who are single. There are people who maybe do, don't have a family with young children, and it's not up to the courts to anticipate every single one of those. And if in a situation like this, this type of thing occurs, make the motion, say, Judge, I didn't understand this. Maybe you didn't. But I'll stay away from every 18-year-old and younger there is except my kids. Is that all right? And, he, and the judge would say yes or no. That's right, Your Honor. I mean, I'm, we don't dispute that this is serious, all right? But yet it's still a collateral consequence. It's a condition of probation. The court cannot anticipate everything that may affect the individual. This situation affects this individual. It may not affect another child sex offender with the same condition who doesn't have these issues. When and that's the, when was the judge aware this was going to be made one of the conditions? Um, well, does the record tell us? The judge, oh, no, the, the record does not. And the judge, I think any sentencing judge, particularly when uh, probation is going to be imposed, understands that they have the discretion to impose any condition they want. What came from the probation department was a recommendation. Was there more than a recommendation in this case? That it must be, it, it, it must be a part, it's not discretionary. This must be essential part of the... I think you can read that from the record, and what I would like to argue to you I could is, is my own personal experience yeah, there, go ahead. Sure. Uh, which is, no, probation doesn't control uh, what the conditions are going to be. It, it doesn't I, matter what they say. They I have been in front of that judge many, many times on child sex cases where an individual has said to the judge at the time of sentencing, look, Your Honor, you know, I will stay away from anybody you want. However, you know, can I be with my child? And the judge has on occasion said, you know, as long as you're with another adult, that's fine. So the judge, the judge has. So the judge could have just ignored what, what they said? The judge said. could have, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, or changed it in some way, shape, or form. So. But I think we're talking about a larger issue than that. I, I, when this is not an individual judge or an individual person, we're talking policy for the entire state here. So it's, it's a little bit uh, off the mark to talk I, about what might have happened in an individual case. Your Honor, I agree with you. I agree. We are talking exactly about what may happen across the state if you impose uh, a condition, a requirement on the judge at the time of plea to try to anticipate every possible condition that might be so imposed. So in your, for you, the rule is that in this kind of circumstance all across the state, it's just enough to say probation. Yes, Your Honor. That's the rule going forward. Yes, Your Honor. In this type of case, in any type of case. Okay. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Counsel Rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, in Respondent's argument, Respondent put out this statement that a person pleading guilty to a sex crime with kids should know that probation probably is going to mean uh, no contact with kids, or words to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. If that knowledge is to be imputed on the defendant prior to the PSI, then that knowledge should be imputed on the, the sentencing judge as well. And I think at the time of the plea, the sentencing judge in that situation can say something like, I haven't made a decision, but you understand if you accept this plea, you may not have contact with children. I think that's very simple. I'm not arguing a particular litany. I'm just using that as an example. 
Okay. Any more questions? Then I yield to the lunch hour. Oh, yes. Judge Sipak. Our motion to withdraw the plea. When was that made? That was made orally, not in writing, correct? That's correct. And it was made at the time of sentence? When was it made? It was made at the first date of sentencing. Sentencing was then adjourned. And I did make the 440 motion, giving the trial court another chance to remedy the situation uh, several months later. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you all. Thank all of you.